My name is Bobby. On this night, one journey ends and another continues, as we see old friends for the last time and offer our fangs for the memories. Barnabas! The stairway has reappeared! Julia, go! I'll follow you! Julia! The staircase is gone! She's alive, but those clothes she's wearing, she could have only have worn them in 1840. That's it. That's why the corridor looks so different. I'm in the 19th century. We are back with Dark Shadows, with a review slash retrospective for the 1840 storyline which begins at the end of episode 1109 and goes to episode 1198 and for the DVDs are volume 23 to 25. While they would do one more storyline after this, this is the final one to feature Barnabas Collins the Vampire. And even my lunchbox will tell you that he's the show's most popular character. So many people consider this to be the unofficial end to Dark Shadows. The show had gone from an audience of 18 million at its height to only 12 million. Different stations throughout the U.S. had stopped airing it. And even worse for you teeny boppers out there, there were no longer any Dark Shadows actors on the cover of Sixteen magazine. I want my David Selby! The gothic sets and special effects made it one of the most expensive soaps on the air. Plus, the actors had renegotiated their salaries during the show's peak and were getting more money. Several cast members had already moved on, and so had most of the writers. Only Sam Hall and Gordon Russell remained. The creative heart of Dark Shadows, executive producer Dan Curtis, was running out of ideas and just hoping it would end. And so were the show's two main actors, Jonathan Frid and Grayson Hall. Despite this, they still had a show to put on. So Dan Curtis, Sam Hall, and Gordon Russell got together for a grueling, 52-hour story session. Now, they had produced a few duds before, like the Leviathan story, which brought down the ratings. So this time, they were looking for a surefire hit. And they looked back upon all the things that had worked before. And their most popular stories were when they went back in time to 1795 and to 1897. So they were going to do it again. And they picked the year 1840 because it was right in the middle of the other two years and wouldn't mess too bad with the continuity of 1795 or with 1897. With several actors gone, Dark Shadows newbies Virginia Vestoff and Jean Lindsay played the roles intended for Catherine Lee Scott and Don Briscoe. And Dark Shadows veteran John Carlin played the role of Desmond Collins, which was intended for Roger Davis. Episode 1126 also featured a cameo appearance by Christine Domenici as the barmaid. Christine had won the Miss American Vampire Contest during the promotion for House of Dark Shadows. However, Jonathan Frid, who had seen almost all of his co-stars have the opportunity to play different roles, had become bored with Barnabas and refused to play the vampire any longer. So for the story arc after this, the writers had to create a new character for him, Bramwell Collins, and set that story in 1840 parallel time, making this arc the final appearance of Elizabeth, Angelique, Professor Stokes, Dr. Julia Hoffman, and of course, Barnabas Collins. While zombies are attacking Collinwood, Dr. Julia Hoffman escapes through a stairway into time and ends up in the Collinwood of 1840. There she meets Ben Stokes, Barnabas's old servant, and with his help, 
She introduces herself as Julia Collins, the daughter of the original Barnabas Collins and the sister to his son. Julia releases Barnabas from his coffin, but he emerges as a bloodthirsty vampire and tries to kill her, but stops when through the power of the I Ching, the life force of the 1970 Barnabas enters into the body of the 1841. Desmond Collins has returned to Collinsport with a present for Quentin, the severed head of the warlock Judas Zachary. In 1692, the judge Amadeus Collins sentenced Judah to death now in 1840, he possesses the body of Gerard Stiles, plans revenge against the Collins family, and stages it so that Quentin Collins looks guilty of witchcraft. Daphne Harridge has come to Collinwood to kill Quentin, but falls in love with him. Lamar Trask is out to kill Barnabas because he believes that Barnabas killed his father. In addition, Gabriel Collins wants to kill his own father for the inheritance, and Angelique wants to kill Julia because she can tell that Julia is in love with Barnabas. One of the things that I don't like about some of the later episodes of Dark Shadows is the series tends to repeat itself. It does it again here, but because it's kind of the end of the series, I like that it recaptures what worked before, because it makes it a groovy last hurrah. We get all three versions of Barnabas, the evil vampire, the reluctant vampire, and the cured vampire. Julia gets to be a mad scientist again when she tries to revive Judah Zachary. It's the sedative! It's the sedative! And the humor that was so prevalent in the 1897 story is back. There are plenty of clever lines, and the somber character Lamar Trask, who works as a mortician, is constantly made the butt of jokes. I am Lamar Trask of Trask Memorial Chapel, at your service, sir. Well, I hope not yet. Please, thank you. The story itself is like a sequel to 1795. The little boy Daniel is now the aging patriarch of Collinwood, and he still remembers the horrors of years ago. Also, Barnabas' old servant Ben Stokes is back, and what I love about Ben is Barnabas never bid him. Their loyalty and respect to each other was purely out of friendship. You know my secret! No one must know my secret! Mr. Barnabas, let her go. She's a friend. Ben? How old? How old? I never thought I'd see you again. Ben, how many years? Can't you tell by looking at me? Mr. Barnabas, it's 1840. My family, my father. Your father's been dead these many years. I'm the last left. And the boy, Daniel, he must be alive. He's an old man now, dying. Everything's changed. Reverend Trask's son is out to solve his father's conflict with Barnabas. Angelique is back, and there's another witch trial. Shirts are ripoff, but they make enough changes so that it's still fun. My only complaint, at least about this section, is sometimes they'll hit upon these really interesting new ideas, but because they're so focused on using that tried and true formula, they don't explore them. For instance, at one point, Professor Stokes uses his stairway into time and appears in 1840. Now, he's a professor of the occult, and with his knowledge, he would be such a dynamic adversary for Gerard. But they don't do it. All they have him do is explain the parallel time room. This is just one of many examples. And I think if they would have explored these ideas, they could have turned a groovy last hurrah into one of the great Dark Shadow storylines. While the plot isn't exactly new, they actually bring in quite a few new characters. At times, it seems like these new characters get more screen time than our old favorites, perhaps as a way of making old material seem fresh again. But once you get past that, these new characters are actually pretty groovy. And I especially like James Storm as Gerard Stiles. In the past two stories, we have seen Gerard the Ghost, and they have built him up to be the supreme evil being. He makes Satan look like Shirley Temple. And now we get to meet him in human form. And this could be really disappointing. Because how do you live up to that? So instead, they surprise you, where you don't know what to make of him. He seems charming and funny, but he's also sly and arrogant. Then when he becomes possessed by Judah Zachary, those sinister traits become amplified. Just look at him, Mr. Styles. I have chosen you, and you shall become me. Through you I shall live again. The mask! Put on the mask! 
Whatever we want will be ours. Put on the mask. No one can make an evil face like James Storm. You absolutely sense his power when you look at him, and he makes an exciting villain for the story. However, because the real Judah Zachary is mostly off screen, there's still a sense of mystery to it. And because nothing is as scary as our own imaginations, he actually does live up to what we previously imagined Gerard Ruby like. Now stay seated, because our next character is Gabriel Collins, played by Christopher Pinnock. Chris is a cool, talented guy, and I think this is his best character on the show. And you can tell he had a ball playing him. Gabriel is a classic mustache-twirling villain. First of all, he's got a mustache. He's full of self-pity, cunning, evil, and hilariously sarcastic. Well, well. Do you always express your gratitude so physically? Just like Mr. Potter in It's a Wonderful Life, Chris works that wheelchair, where it becomes like an extension of his own personality. However, he's actually faking the disability. He can walk, and does so whenever he commits MURDER! He also has occasional moments of vulnerability, like during his scenes with his father. Chris remembered that his agent was watching that day, and for his performance, instead of trying to fake tears, he just made eye contact with Louis Edmonds and reacted to him. I never could explain why you're alive, Father. You never cared for me much, even as a boy. You'd say, be like Quentin. You've got to get out and lead men someday. You've got to play games and win and win. I played games, Father. I played until Quentin stopped them forever. I made him stop them. You know why? So you'd have to take care of me. I've made you take care of me. I did. God, I did. It makes you understand why he became a villain, which makes him more interesting, but it never takes away from his villainy. However, the one who gets really rounded out is our favorite witch, Angelique, played by Laura Parker. Now, this Angelique is directly from 1795 and has no knowledge of the present-day Collinwood. Angelique is still enamored with Barnabas and returns every year to his chain coffin. She starts off as evil as she was in the 18th century, but as the story progresses, we find out her backstory. In the 1690s, Angelique was known as Miranda Duval, and she became a follower and developed her powers from Judah Zachary. But to save her own neck, she testified against Judah at his witchcraft trial. And now, in 1840, Judah, in the form of Gerard, is her deadly enemy. When Laura was first cast, she didn't want to play a villain. She wanted to be the innocent girl. And here she finally gets to do the more innocent and pure-hearted version of Angelique. And while I prefer her evil, I like that they're doing something new with the character. In contrast, they're not doing anything new with the relationship of Barnabas and Julia. Their chemistry together is always a highlight. But after a certain point, it seems like they're almost never on screen together. Before this arc, it seemed like they were heading in the direction of developing their romance, but for whatever reason, they put it on hold. And it's kind of a disappointing use of these two great characters, especially since it's the last time we see them. Aside from that, though, I actually really like how this story concludes. With being back in time, having to switch to Bramwell, and then being cancelled soon after, the series didn't exactly end in ideal circumstances to do a big final episode, but for what they had to work with, I actually think they did a great job at ending the Barnabas era. One of the key elements to Dark Shadows is the relationship between Barnabas and Angelique, and here it actually resolves. Barnabas sees Bramwell and Catherine together in the parallel time room, and realizes that he actually does love Angelique. Angelique, I never knew. I love you. That's why you must live. I love you, Angelique. After all these years, after all that's happened between us, I love you. Angelique? No, Angelique! You never hurt me. You never hurt me. You never knew until it was too late. He did love her before he came enamored with Josette, so it's not that far-fetched. And I love how in Total Dark Shadow style, it ends tragically, with her dying before he could tell her. 
When Barnabas, Stokes, and Julia are leaving 1840, they say goodbye to Desmond Collins, played by John Carlin. Now, John Carlin normally played Barnabas' slave, Willie. And even though he's not Willie in this scene, it's still Jonathan Frid saying goodbye to John Carlin. Then, when they get back to 1971, everything is normal. They prevent a disaster, and Collinwood is finally at peace. And Elizabeth, is played by Joan Bennett, comes in and tells them that they are late for the Historical Society meeting. From the first episode, Elizabeth Collins Stoddard has been the matriarch of the house. She represents Collinwood. And before they had vampires and ghosts, one of the big deals of Dark Shadows was, we have Joan Bennett on the show. So her being in that final scene with them makes it a fitting farewell to the regular characters. After 1840, there was 1840 parallel time. Then in the April of 1971, the series was canceled. And that was the end of Dark Shadows a Soap Opera. Because there are so many unanswered questions, Sam Hall wrote an article for TV Guide that was published in October of 1971 titled, Here's What Really Happened to Barnabas and Company. The article explores what might have happened to the main characters of the series. Angelique's backstory as Miranda Duvall was further explored by Angelique herself, Laura Parker, in her novel, Dark Shadows, The Salem Branch. So I hope you don't think that I've lost my head, but I give it three morticians out of four. If you're looking for this masterpiece farewell to Barnabas Collins, you're not going to get it. With the circumstances going on behind the scenes, I don't even know if that was possible. But if you're just looking for a good dark shadowy time, 1840 certainly delivers. So, thank you for watching Dusty Old Movies, and I hope you enjoy my new weight loss book.